Advent joy, you may be seated um, as uh, we talk about joy uh, this morning. Um, in our second service, we're actually going to be baptizing Anastasia Johnson and Ben Johnson's uh, kids, Mavi and, um, and Tegan, um, and, and celebrating that on this joyous day. Um, in light of that, I have not done this yet, um, and it's kind of, um, you know, we've transitioned out of our denomination, so we're, we're, we're always in the process of figuring what life may look like that, um, but um, we, we generally, if, if you want to become a member of Nature Coast, you, you can, and a few weeks ago, Bill and Karen uh, Hare, our Harar uh, joined us. I want you to stand and welcome. They are faithful to this service. So Bill and Karen, welcome to Nature Coast. And um, we are excited to have you and uh, excited to see what, uh, what you're gonna, how you're going to bless us um, with all God has given you and who he's created you to be. She already helped with our gala um, um, this uh, uh, last couple of weeks. So thank you and welcome. So it's always good. Um, we have a lot of new faces around here. Not at the, uh, things have been backwards since coming back from COVID. Um, uh, we, as we began to go back, um, our, our 9 o'clock service all of a sudden became the fuller service. Um, um, and our 11 was dragging. Now our 11 is kind of caught up and, and, and the kids uh, seem to be back until the next thing hits us possibly. But um, anyway, it's been kind of unique to see the the changes um, that, that happen when kind of life changes um, around um, us. So um, we are excited to see all that God is doing here. One other thing on the season of Advent joy. Uh, Walt, thank you for that, uh, that uh, 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 sharing of what you do on Christmas morning. Um, you now have, uh, have given me some, something to share with my wife, who actually is at the 9 o'clock this morning and not at the 11 o'clock service, that every time I want Cool Whip, I'm thinking about Jesus cleansing me from all of my sin. <laughs> so who knew the gospel could taste so good? <laughs> right? I mean, in a way, that's even biblical, taste and see that the Lord is good. So even if you do that on Christmas morning, um, um, there is. So anyway, um, Advent joy. Um, if there is a favorite Sunday um, of Advent, I always thought it was, I mean, who could pick between hope, joy, peace, and love because they're all beautiful things. Hope resonates so deeply uh, within me. Peace does too. But joy, at least in this season of my life, has taken on um, you know, maybe more added meeting, and then next week will be love, which is uh, where we end. Um, so next week is kind of our Christmas service. Um, it's our last gathering uh, uh, beforehand. That does remind me of an announcement that the Sunday after Christmas, there is no end gathering here. That's December 26th. Um, there is, we did this last year, there's no end gathering here, and there will be no online live either. We will be producing something and sending it out via our social media outlets, uh, probably Saturday, Christmas night, or the morning, but we will be back January 2nd um, in worship and gathering here. So that is coming up. But next week, next week is um, kind of our Christmas service uh, here where we will be uh, gathered uh, together um, to celebrate one more time um, with Advent love before um, Christmas morning, which will come that next Saturday um, there. All right, Advent joy. Um, I, I did, uh, I, I'm mixing it up these days. Um, this one really was on purpose uh, because I chose the Old Testament prophet. We're not used to the Old Testament prophets prophets, especially like a guy we've never heard of, who is Zephaniah, um, and, um, and then uh, St. Paul's reading from uh, the book of Philippians as we talk about joy. Joy at Christmas time, I mean, we, the, the old Christmas carol, Joy to the World, which we actually um, sang today. I mean, Christmas, uh, you know, Christmas is such a mixture for me, um, because there's parts of me that really love Christmas, and it has joy. Joy almost for me um, sometimes deals even with anticipation. Um, anticipation is a child and all that that meant. 
uh, for me, um, even anticipation um, as an adult, um, because there's just, there's something even when it comes to the Christmas story, the biblical Christmas story of Jesus coming to earth, um, which is, is just so incredibly otherworldly. It's incredibly beautiful to think that God became man, um, all of those things associated with it, um, and, and, and even the things we do culturally um, really kind of stress the importance of, of that. But with that comes this joy um, and excitement, and I think our, our service already, as we read and as, as Walt alluded to, um, there's just this mixture of just being run ragged to our wits end, going here and going there and making sure we've got this and, you know, oops, that person gave me a present. I ain't even thought, and I got to run down and get them a present. And I mean, we just, seems like there's not a lot of joy. It's just like one stream of anxiety after another. And, and that then becomes maybe a concentrated reality at Christmas time, but that's probably a picture of most of our lives, um, even post-Christmas um, as uh, we are. And then, you know, we have all of this longing and anticipation, kind of this joyful um, anticipation for Christmas. And then um, come next Sunday or the Sunday afterwards and, and the days after, it just disappoints us because we can never quite grab it. Um, the way our hearts want to grab it. Um, there's always an unintended circumstance. Um, uh, there's always the circumstance that we had just created in our own mind that this is going to be the best ever. And sometimes those things pan out, and then sometimes they don't. And so there's just all this mixture. But in the midst of this, there's this constant thing of joy. And so the passages we re read weren't written at Christmas time. Uh, for us, but they are the passages um, for them. And so, um, we're going to talk about a music that soothes the soul. And, um, and we all know what music that is, don't we? <laughs> no, um, maybe you guys do. Anyway, this is biblical music um, that soothes the soul. And um, we're going to start by reading the Zephaniah passage. Um, as you put that up there... Um, so Zephaniah is an Old Testament prophet. One of the reasons I, I love this uh, passage, because have you ever heard of, um, and, and, you know, sometimes people share, you know, someone will always say, um, you know, in the Bible you have this Old Testament God, and then you have the New Testament God. And it's like, nope, you're exactly right. And we're going to see that big fat no today um, either, because usually the picture we get of the Old Testament God is this, angry grandfather who's just uh, can't help himself all the time. And then all of a sudden we get to the New Testament and he bursts out in all of this grace and joy and love. Um, but that is not true. God is consistent. And there's, uh, there's deeper discussion that I won't go into to that. But uh, one thing we've missed, so this is in Zephaniah 3. If we'd read Zephaniah 1 and 2, we would have seen why People complain about the altar. The judgment is coming. The people of God have just not really been doing the right thing. And prophets in the Old Testament, in a way, if you, you think that's kind of a really religious word, they're really just prosecutors. The, the prophets come and they take Moses' writing, which is the Torah, the law of God, and they present it to the people of God and they prosecute the people of God and says, like, here is what the law said and you are guilty. You, you, you're guilty. And all I have to do is read the law that's there and then see the choices and actions you've made and you are guilty. And with that guilt for these people has come judgment. Um, they are in exile. They're no longer in their own a particular land. And so Zephaniah has laid that out for the people of God. So I think this is helpful for us, just a little, that was a little Old Testament um, lesson there <clears throat> when it comes to all the prophets. All the prophets bring prosecution against the people of God, and the people of God are always guilty. And, um, and they, but they, they, they're guilty, they're stuck, they're in judgment, and they need a deliverer. 
And so the prophet also then comes after the law is exposed and their guilt is exposed. Every prophet ends their book with a promise. And um, I use that word a lot, so I'm going to use joy to talk about promise. Um, Because I, you know, sometimes that word, well, you know, I always say God promises and he doesn't lie. Um, what, what does that mean? What is the promise? And so here is chapter 3. So not been good. They've been naughty, not nice. And so instead of Zephaniah writing, Santa Claus is coming to n- town because it is true that this God sees you when you're sleeping. He sees you when you're awake. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But it is not true that this prophet then says, so be good for goodness sake, because it hasn't happened. And the Old Testament is one long story of prophet and judge coming to the people of God, and they could never be good for goodness sake. And so the prophets begin, there must be another way. And that other way always comes with promise. Sing. So this is right after chapter three. I mean, right after chapter, the first two chapters. Sing. What do you mean, sing, daughter of Zion? Sing, people of God. What do you mean, sing? You have just laid out the law. You have just prosecuted us. You have found us guilty. But now I want you to sing. But I want you to sing because there's a promise. There is a promise that I want to give to you. Sing, daughter of Zion. Sing, the people of God. Basically, sing, church. Shout aloud, church. Be glad and rejoice with all of your heart. What do you mean be glad and rejoice? One of the things I love about the prophets, and we're going to see this because I'm going to read Paul's reading as well, is they're going to talk to us about joy. Um, and they're going to talk about us what it means to be joyful. But that joyfulness never comes because their circumstances are all perfect. There isn't this kind of Pandora view of life that just says, I'm going to be joyful. We live in a broken world. These were broken people. There were two chapters of their brokenness. There were two chapters of the one word that had come to them already, which was the law of God. God always speaks in two words. He speaks in law and he speaks in promise. Those are the two words God always gives. And there's myriads of errors because we can't get those two words right. He's spoken in law, and now he comes with promise. Sing, daughter Zion. Shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all of your heart. I know you're in exile. I know you're not in your own land. But people of God, I want you to shout, and I want you to sing. Why? Why are we to shout and sing? Why are we, I mean, this is so incredible. This is so incredible. And I don't know what we do when we, like, read it. But why are we encouraged to shout and sing? Because of something we did? No. We're told why we can shout and sing. Can we just read it together? Verse 15. Shout and sing, people of God. Why? The Lord has taken your punishment. He has turned your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. He is in your midst. Never again will you fear any harm. Hallelujah. Here into the midst of a broken people, Is this picture of a God. You know, sometimes I think we picture God like that. The, the, God, the God that we picture or we even describe is a God in heaven who just is, he's like sits around waiting to catch us while we make a mistake. There's always a purpose to the promise. 
You go to the next slide. And on that day, once the Lord has done what he's done, on that day, they, everyone else, even the people within Jerusalem, even the people of God themselves, but also the people who may be looking in from the out Zion say this, do not fear Zion, do not let your hands hang limped. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He takes great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. Did the did, did I just make those words up? Are, are these verses we're supposed to shove under the rug? Are these verses that are only meant if Santa's checked his list to see if you've been naughty and nice? These people were naughty. And so are we. On that day, They will say to the church of Christ, I know you've been prosecuted. I know the law have come. The word, the one word of God has come and you've all been found guilty. But you do not need to fear. You do not need to let your hands hang limp. You don't need to cower and just curl up in a little ball because the Lord our God he is with you and he is with you and I know I've described who you are and who you are is really bad and I know you're in exile and I know your enemies seem to be triumphing over you and I know you have put yourself in an impossible position I know also that you've tried to get out of that impossible position yourself and you've never got out of that possible position I know you tried I know you've heard prophets before and for a little while you got ah I'm gonna do better and you try to do better and you've always ended back up here I know you are impossibly stuck I know your enemy seems impossibly strong but you need to know this that in the midst of being stuck in the midst of those places in your life where you can't get out of and you're stuck and you're lonely and you don't know where you're going to take the next step the Lord is with you but you know what this God he is not just the God who is with us this God who is with us He is mighty to save. He's mighty to save. He can do it. He can do it. I almost went all Doug Alexander on you there. (laughs) You got to know Doug. I know. He will take great delight in you. See, sometimes I think we view this Christianity this way too. Oh, yeah. God came and he died on the cross for me. I was found guilty, too. And he's mighty to save. And he saved me. But then somehow we start walking through a Christianity is God loves me because he has to love me. Because he said he would, he promised he would, he died on the cross, but he sure does not like me. He tolerates me. Isn't that how we view, thank God for the cross. Came all this way and he did that for me. And I know, I know he probably, after seeing my day yesterday, probably is just rolling his eyes at me. No, he takes Great delight in you. I mean, what are we supposed to do with these words? Are, are these throwaway words? Are we allowed to preach on these words? Am I allowed to say these words? I know somebody, but it even seems like we're made to feel guilty if we say them. I mean, literally, I'm really asking, can, can, can we, are we allowed? Are we allowed to preach this in the way it was written. There's no qualifier there. In fact, the qualifiers seem to be in the first two chapters, and the qualifiers we put on don't seem to be qualifiers for the prophet. 
He will take great delight in you. And in his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. When I was a little child, I used to go to church camp. I don't know if they sing these choruses anymore. But the one chorus we would sing is, I went to that church camp up in Ohio, was this, Jesus is the rock of my salvation. His banner over me is love. Are we even allowed to say that? Should we teach our kids that? Should we teach them that when they're little and then make them doubt that the rest of their life? Is that what we do? Hey, child, you go to church camp and you sing, his banner over me is love, but the rest of the week, I'm going to try to make you doubt that so you'll behave. Is his banner over you love? I think Zephaniah says yes. And then as we go through the last ones, I'm just going to read this real quick. These last two verses, and you go right to the next one, because I want to go right as soon as I'm done. No, i got to read it first. Um, um, you're going to go right to it as soon as I'm reading, because it's all together. I will remove from you all who mourn over the loss of your appointed festivals, which is a burden and a reproach for you. Some Old Testament stuff. We won't go there, but I want you to keep listening. At that time, I will deal with all who oppressed you. I will rescue the lame. I will gather the exiles. I will give them praise and honor in every land where they have suffered shame. Next slide. At that time, I will gather you. At that time, I will bring you home. I will give you honor and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your very eyes, says the Lord. Who does all the verbs? The Lord. Go back. One more slide. I will remove. I will deal. I will rescue. I will gather. I will give them praise. Next slide. I will gather you. I will bring you home. I will give you honor and praise. I will restore you. Who does it all? God. He does it all. That's the Old Testament God right there. The one who delights in you and sings over you and does it all. That is promise. He has promised to do it all because he is in our midst and he is mighty to save. We're going to close real quick with Philippians 4. This is going to be a short little devotional Bible study. Short. Not going to unpack it. By the way, Paul is writing about joy. And he's writing from prison, so he is not in the best of circumstances either. Um, when he writes this, he doesn't know how long he's going to live, um, but he is in prison. And what does he say in prison? Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say again, rejoice. There's another camp song for you. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. So there you go. Uh, rejoice. I mean, I, I learned all of these songs as a kid, and then the people like tried to take them all away from me the rest of my life. Then it says this. So we're going to walk through this real quick. So rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Um, the actual word there in the King James, which actually might, is forbearance. Let your long-suffering, your gentleness in difficult circumstances, um, the idea that you forbear, um, you kind of work through things, then you're, the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. So I'm going to leave it on that slide. Go back to that slide. So we actually have a couple words from God here. 
because we have some instruction here that Paul is giving to us. Um, first instruction, let your gentleness, forbearance be evident to everyone. That's a command. And six, do not be anxious about anything. So there's two, there's a word from God. There's two words from God. But I want you to read that again. And this, this is an open-ended shout out the answer in the middle of church question, if you know it. On this slide, there is a promise. Can anyone tell me what the promise is? The Lord is near. Hallelujah. There's the promise. It's Christmas, and the Lord is near. Actually, there's three commands in there. I missed the first one. What's the other one? You have, let your gentleness be evident to all. Do not be anxious. And what's the first one? Rejoice. That's a command. That's written in command form. So you rejoice. You be gentle. Let your gentleness be known to all. You don't be anxious for anything. There is... The one word from God, those are commands. You could say they are law, but in the middle of that is a promise. How can we rejoice? How can we let our gentleness be evident to all? How can we not be anxious when all of our life is anxious? How is that possible? How is St. Paul telling us that is possible? You know, is he just, you know, you're, you're sitting back there in the corner worrying, Rick, and I come and grab you by the shirt, and I just say, don't worry, Rick. Why are you worrying, Rick? You don't need to worry. You don't need to worry. The Bible says, do not worry, Rick. Why are you worrying? You are worrying. The Bible says not to worry. Is that what we do? I see Rick back in the corner because he has no idea what he's going to buy Jack for Christmas. <laughs> Or if he's going to buy something for Jack. And he's worried about it. And I come back to Rick and I say, Rick, the Lord is near. He's near. He's got you. I mean, we're meant to read this this way. What is the promise? He is near. That promise is meant to create faith in us. Oh, the Lord is near. We're supposed to say, oh, good, the Lord is near. I don't need to worry. I can be pretty gentle in this situation that's kind of freaking driving me crazy. And I can rejoice. And then why do we have joy? Because Christmas came. And the Lord is near. And here's our problem with joy. We feel anxious. We're not too forbearing. And we don't always feel like rejoicing. So we are like the people of old in Zephaniah. And we have to pacify that anxiety. We have to find a way to stop the anxiety. We have to find a way to learn to be more gentle. We have to find a way to uh, bring joy. And and here's the question. How will we find joy? Will we find it in trying to do harder? Or will we find it because the Lord is near? You know, I was raised in a tradition, and I still hear this tradition, you're not in a place of joy, and people will look right at you and say, your joy is tied to your obedience. It is not tied to your obedience. It is tied to his obedience, and he came near. That's where your joy is. And if it is tied to your obedience, you will never experience joy because you will always be found guilty under the law of God. The 
There's the two words. And in the middle is a promise that he is near. And he sings those promises. You know, we can forbear when we know our victory has been won. He has it in hand. Sometimes I wonder in doing church life and church world, it doesn't honestly take long. It's probably true in most of life. I don't know. I used to work in the corporate world, so sometimes I think it happens more in the church. It's like the church is like always filled with some drama. Did you hear about so-and-so? Why did you do that? When we create drama, you know, our breaker back there went out during the gala and our Christmas tree lights weren't lit. <laughs> Drama! No, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And over the years, if you've known me a while, and maybe my office people know, I like have very little room for drama anymore. The great whatever has taken over. Because the Lord is near. I don't mean to sound trite, and neither does Paul. Paul writes, do not be anxious, because he knows we're anxious. I mean, if we weren't anxious, why would he write that? He's writing to anxious people like you and me. And if you ever got to the point, I mean, this is the other thing that always surprises me. If you ever got to the point um, that you said you were never anxious anymore, and it was my year and time to talk about Philippians 4, 7, about do not be anxious for nothing, don't come to church that Sunday. You don't need the sermon. Just stay home. Right? That portion of the Bible doesn't apply to you anymore because you've arrived. <laughs> it's silly, isn't it? Don't be anxious. So he's writing to anxious people. And in the midst of this, going back to all of the drama, what if you heard someone come to you in this month talking about some drama? This is why we went like Paul. And you said, the Lord is near. That kind of ticks us off, doesn't it? Like, no, but I'm mad. <laughs> no, no, no. I've, I've got to make sure that person knows what they did. i got to make sure that, that everyone knows that what they, 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 they did um, um, uh, shouldn't have happened. I, mean, I, 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 got, I got like this beautiful example here this morning. I, I'm just wondering if I should share it because it's funny. But I think I will. But I could share in the second service because my wife won't be there. <laughs> Actually, I don't even know if this, so this came up this week. I am telling you, this is the stuff that people argue over at churches. And honestly, I have no idea if this is my wife or not. But uh, if you will notice this morning, you cannot believe I'm going to go here, can you? Because we talked about this this week. These are the kind of things. If you will notice this morning, um, we, um, we always uh, change this out. And this says peace. So we're going to go get joy and put it up. And so we go to the back and there's no joy and she just said, whoops, you know where joy is? Joy is buried underneath one of those very beautiful, gala, wintry-looking things that is stapled together. <laughs> uh, so we, we thought maybe we could pull it out. So we pulled the stuff out. We could pull out. We're not going to do it. You know what we decided this week? That we could have Advent joy without joy up here. Because whether it's there or not, the Lord is near. Do you see what we do? 
Do you see what can happen in any body of Christ? It's honestly things like that that end up destroying churches. Well, I don't know what they're thinking. You know. Listen, I want Nature Coast to be this place where we laugh in the midst of our broken lives. And I know my story, and I know your story. And we live in a broken mess. But the reality of Zephaniah that, that he was saying there is that in the middle of exile, in the middle of their disobedience, that God is present and he is mighty to save. And he is always present and he is always mighty to save. And, and that's silly, but there are far deeper things happening in your story and my story than that. I see Joe shaking his head back there. He had chemo this week. Joe, the Lord is near, and he's mighty to save. I don't know what all of the stories are here, but the Lord is near, and he's mighty to save. And if I long anything for Nature Coast during this Christmas season, it's to live in the reality that the Lord is near, and that we are called to cultivate that joy in the midst of the world's brokenness, not deny the world's brokenness, not deny my own brokenness, not to deny the brokenness around me, but to cultivate the joy in the midst of it because that's what God did in Zephaniah. They were, that, those people were in a politi political corruption. They were in religious corruption. There was oppression. There was all of those things, and yet he says, the Lord comes and sings over you. He is present, and he is in the midst of all of that brokenness. And just as he was in Zephaniah's day, so he is in our day, and so he is in whatever part of your story that is a, a, a broken, whatever part you're struggling in, this morning he is delighting over you in singing. He has put his banner over you with love. And really, all Zephaniah is asking, St. Paul is asking, as the promise is given, is do we have the courage to trust God's promise, period? I used a human word here. I don't know that it's biblical. But I think we struggle with delight. The human word I would say is this morning, do we want to risk delight? I mean, even in the church, we struggle with delight because if you are delighting, even in the midst of the brokenness, um, you're not supposed to do that. Um, or if you are supposed to do it, you're supposed to do it a, a certain way. It is risky to delight, but I don't think that's the risk and the risk is a human word, that Scripture is asking the people of God to take. Will you risk believing the idea that God literally this morning delights in you and sings over you? Will you risk believing that? Because there's many that will tell you that that's risky teaching. Will you have the courage, take the risk this morning to believe that he loves you, that he woke up this morning and on the refrigerator of heaven is your picture. And he said, that's my girl and that's my boy. Can you risk believing that? And shut out all of the noise that maybe, maybe thinks for a second that God woke up this morning and he had to take your picture down because he just felt too much shame over what you did last night. Can you risk that this is the God of Christmas? And he came all the way down to be near you and me.
There's that song. Give me that old time rock and roll. Why? Because it's music that soothes the soul. The anthem of Scripture is to tell me the old, old story that I'll sing about in glory forever of Jesus and his love. That's the music that soothes our soul. That is the music of eternity. And maybe it will be sung to jazz. Maybe it will be sung to rock and roll. Maybe it will be sung by your favorite artist. But that will be the lyrics that he delights in you with his love. And he rejoices over you with singing. Do you have the courage to believe that? That is the hardest thing that we'll ever have to do. That's the hard part of the Christian life is to believe that he adores and delights in you. Because you will have many voices that tell you he doesn't. Advent joy. He is near. So rejoice. If you're helping serve the table, we'd love for you to come and do this. The Lord is so near. You know, he was going away. You know, his disciple says, well, we want to go with you because where you are, we want to go. And he says, well, right now you can't come, but I'm still going to be near you because I'm sending the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit comes and lives and resides in you. Um, but I'm also going to give you my broken body and my shed blood, and it's for you. And it's to remind you of Christmas. It's to remind you of how near I am. And so the Lord is near, people of God. Come taste and see that he is good, as Ali sings. We weren't going to share, I wasn't going to share that story because well, I don't know if it was Lynn or not. We knew if she knew, she would be down here undoing it and fixing it. <laughs> and we don't want you to do that. We are good. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'll find um, uh, um, when we um, do that. Listen. Remember that the rumors of grace, forgiveness, and the redemption of all things are true, even if your Christmas is a disaster. And I will leave you with this. The Lord is near. And he promised. And he does not lie. Go in peace.